Estamos apresentando hoje uma nova edição da Entrevistas FPA e temos conosco um convidado é, muito especial, muito importante, que é o professor de Economia, Ha Jun Chan, é, de origem da Coreia do Sul, mas que atualmente é professor de, de Economia na Universidade de Cambridge, é, na Inglaterra. É, talvez muitos já tenham tido a oportunidade de ler algumas de suas obras, um conjunto de obras que vem desde os anos 1990 e que inclui alguns livros, quatro, segundo ele me informou, é, traduzidos ao português. Um deles muito conhecido é o Chutando a Escada. Há um outro também que se chama 23 coisas que não se contaram sobre o capitalismo. Um terceiro que é Maus Samaritanos, dois pontos, o mito é, do livre comércio e a história secreta do capitalismo. E o seu livro mais recente, que eu fui agraciado aqui com uma cópia, é, que é o Economia, o modo de usar, na tradução uh, para português. Então nós vamos conversar um pouco com ele, e ele que está em visita essa semana aqui ao Brasil para dar diversas palestras em outros locais e nos cedeu, estamos muito agradecidos por essa oportunidade de entrevistá-lo aqui na Fundação Perseu Abramo. Uh, professor, uh, welcome uh, to Brazil and welcome to the Perseu Abramo Foundation. Thank you for having me. And, uh, I understand that you have you are planned to do several uh, lectures mm -hmm. uh, this week here in Sao Paulo, basically. So could you tell us a little bit what you pretend to explore during uh, those uh, lectures and, yeah. and meetings or whatever? <laughs> no, the, the main purpose of my visit this time is uh, to present a couple of lectures at uh, La Porge, uh, which is a Latin American program for Rethinking Development Economics, L-A-P-O-R-D-E. So in, those, uh, the, uh, in that program, I'll be giving two lectures. One is called State Markets and Institutions in Economic Development. So in that lecture, I'll be mainly kind of, uh, challenging this myth of uh, free trade and free market, this view that all the successful economies have uh, used uh, free trade and free market policies and that's uh, what uh, the, uh, all the developing countries should be using and I'll be kind of challenging that myth first by showing the historical evidence that most of uh, today's rich countries actually have used protectionism, subsidies, state-owned enterprises all the things that they tell the developing countries not to use today. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be discussing the theoretical reasons why that, rather than free trade, free market policies, are uh, the secret of economic success. And then I'll be giving another lecture in that workshop uh, on the East Asian development experience, uh, looking at the economic development experience of uh, Japan, South Korea, you know, Taiwan, I mean, these countries were much, uh, I mean, especially Korea and Taiwan, they, they were much poorer and you know, less industrialized than Brazil, for example. And in the last uh, 50, 60 years, uh, they have achieved huge economic transformation, so discussing the experience. And then I'll be giving another lecture at uh, Puki uh, in Sao Paulo on the, well, the title of that lecture is uh, uh, Reconstructing the Development Discourse and the subtitle is Bringing Production Back In. So in that uh, lecture, I'll be mainly arguing that, you know, that these days we see the development process mainly as a process of uh, poverty reduction, but that is actually only one tiny part of the development process the essence of the development process lies in the transformation of the productive structure and then the social changes that follow from that. I mean, it, this is quite a Marxist uh, view of development. Mm -hmm. So the material progress actually creates uh, changes in social and political conditions. 
but you know this was uh, the, the at the center of uh, development economics uh, when you know people like uh, Celso Frutado and Gunnar mm. Medal and uh, the Simon Kuznets these people are writing about development in the last two three decades uh, somehow we have lost sight of that and you know, development is uh, more or less uh, equated with reducing poverty mm -hmm. so I, I'll be criticizing that uh, perspective and explain why it is important to think about production, employment, work, and uh, those things in thinking about development. Mm -hmm. So as you may know, in Brazil at the present, we are uh, facing, well, an ideological dispute, uh, uh, an important economic discussion about how to retake the growth and development of the country. Yeah. And then again, uh, the present government, which is a result of a parliamentarian coup, mm -hmm. is defending, well, the new liberal ideas of the 1990s, and not only defending them and applying yes, them yes. <laughs> hardly, uh, in, in, a con in, in an important contrast uh, to the period of uh, the Workers' Party's government of President Lula and, and, and Dilma, where we had another uh, perspective and so you have been a very important uh, critic uh, to those policies of yeah. not only of the 1990s but of, of the present and here we are also facing this uh, statement that well developmentism is over those ideas are not uh, important anymore they didn't work etc etc so that's how do you deal with that in terms of arguments between uh, talking about development? Mm -hmm. Protectionism or liberalism? Mm -hmm. What should be the way uh, the president considering all the actual uh, circumstances? No, you know, economic theories and historical evidence are strongly on the side of the protectionists. So, I mean, as I try to show in my books, uh, almost all the developed countries of today, I mean, uh, maybe the exception is the Netherlands in the uh, 17th and 18th century, Switzerland in the 18th century, uh, and there are a few exceptions, but most of them basically use uh, protectionist policies to develop their economy against uh, competition from superior foreign today, powers. Trump again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, the very idea of uh, protectionism in its uh, modern form was actually invented by Alexander Hamilton, the first ever Treasury Secretary, or what would be called Finance Minister in other countries of the United States of America. That's the guy you see on the $10 bill. Yeah? You know, he actually invents the theory saying that the government of economically backward nations need to provide protection and subsidies and infrastructure investment and so on in order to promote their uh, immature industries against uh, competition from superior competitors, in his case, you know, mm. producers from England and other European countries. Yeah? Yeah. So, I mean, this idea has been applied again and again and again to produce these economic successes. Of course, like all other, you know, formula for success, uh, the, not all countries that use the idea uh, haven't uh, succeeded. But, you know, th that doesn't discredit the idea itself because uh, without first creating and growing your producers, open market competition, international trade, they will only destroy your producers. Yeah? Of course, uh, some countries uh, have uh, used uh, protectionism much more effectively, like uh, South Korea or Japan or Taiwan uh, than other countries. But uh, this is not because uh, protectionism itself is uh, that, uh, sorry, uh, it's uh, not because uh, that uh, these countries have used a uh, different form of protectionism, but because they also used other policies that make sure that these uh, protectionist policies work. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you compare their development success with uh, what has been going on in the Brazil's 
say since uh, the, the days of uh, the Fernando Enrique Cardozo, basically the one big difference was uh, the macroeconomic policies. Mm -hmm. So the, you had, I mean, initially introduced this uh, high interest rate policy, which probably was necessary at that point to maintain uh, price uh, stability, but then it carried on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it became a huge uh, burden for the producers and you know, because of the political compromise that, uh, that it had to strike, uh, even the Workers' Party was uh, not able to overturn this policy. So you had a situation in which uh, Brazil, together with South Africa, had some of the highest interest rate in the yeah, world. Absolutely. You know? So how do you, when you have a, a high interest rate... Even uh, today. Exactly. It's uh, good for, of course, uh, financial capital uh -huh. because uh, they can earn huge return by just uh, buying government bond and stuff like that. But uh, for producers, this is a huge burden. So in contrast, uh, the countries like Japan, Korea and so on, they made sure that interest rate uh, stays at a relatively low level and uh, long-term investment is uh, the possible. Yeah? So th that was one big difference. Another was uh, that uh, you know, the, in order to make it sure that these uh, protected firms uh, raise productivity and uh, become internationally competitive, you need to provide a lot of other inputs. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you need to provide infrastructure, you need to provide uh, research and development, you need to provide education, most importantly, worker training, mm -hmm. you know, the East Asian countries are very good at uh, providing those things, whereas in Brazil, once again, I mean, there were I mean, uh, not complete absence, but a lot of deficiencies in providing those things. You know? I mean, of course, uh, you had a you know, I mean, uh, very difficult situation in the 80s and 90s with uh, the debt crisis and you know, the public sector investment basically collapsing. So infrastructure the, the, the deteriorated, you know, but, you know, uh, there were, you know, I mean, other areas that uh, you could uh, still have done more, like uh, worker training and so on, but uh, you didn't. So that, that's another issue. And thirdly, you know, uh, you need to uh, accept that, uh, you know, some of these policies were better designed and better implemented in some countries than others. Mm. So I don't know enough details about uh, Brazil's uh, situation, but you know, the, when you provide this uh, the protection and subsidies, you have to make it sure that uh, the recipient firms deliver the result in terms of investment, productivity growth, worker training. Yeah. You have to make it sure that uh, the gains from this is uh, the, the equitably shared not equally, of course, but uh, yeah, yeah, equitably yeah. shared. But you know, the, uh, unfortunately, the, some countries are not as good as others in oh. yeah ensuring those things. So the the results have been rather different. But even accepting that, say, selective industrial policy in Brazil was not as successful as that in say South Korea or Japan. I mean, one thing that. I just that I cannot understand is how Brazilians and other Latin American uh, uh, people accept this uh, liberal argument that you know all those uh, import substitution policies in the 50s, 60s, and 70s are total failure, and therefore the only way for this uh, liberalism. No, I mean that the evidence shows. You know, I don't have uh, data for Brazil that, that, that alone, but you know. Per capita income in Latin America in the 60s and 70s grew at the rate of about 3.1 percent. Yeah? Mm -hmm. In the following uh, the 35 years of uh, liberalism, it has grown at 0.8 percent. Yeah? Exactly. So what are we talking that's about? The, yeah, yeah, of course, that's the main, that's the main data. Uh, if you want to make a comparison, no doubt about that. Now you mentioned an, uh, an important point as one of those elements that should be added to a national uh, development strategy, which is the transfer of technology, knowledge, uh, development of uh, science and research, uh, which obviously is something that has been quite weak in our region. And that's also one of the things that you mention in your book, Kicking Away the Ladder, 
that who is developed uh, the president, they want to, don't want to transfer <laughs> this knowledge yeah. in order to allow uh, other countries to, to develop. And another point in, in, in this same book, you, you also, well, that's the essence of the book, the, the discussion about the international division of labor, yeah. uh, but of some time ago, mm -hmm. how, how would you analyze this division at the present, particularly with this uh, new situation of the importance of economics in, in Asia in particular, China, uh, yes. the, the, the countries that you recently yeah. mentioned? Mm. No, actually, it, uh, you know, when you look at the, the current situation in Brazil, I mean, I get so like angry because you know this used to be the industrial powerhouse of the southern hemisphere. Until 1970, I think uh, Brazil produced uh, more manufactured products than Korea, China, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong put together. You know, maybe yeah. yeah. And you know, the, the, even until the 1980s, uh, despite all the difficulties, you know, manufacturing sector is uh, accounting for 35 percent of GDP. Now, I mean, it's only about 11 percent, 10 percent. So, w w what has been happening? Basically, what has been happening was uh, the regression of the economic structure. Because when people like uh, Furtado and uh, uh, so on were arguing for industrialization, mm -hmm. the whole justification was that the primary commodity sector is uh, not dynamic. Eh? Mm -hmm. So the manufacturing sector is where innovation is, uh, is where productivity growth that, that happens. You know, that's uh, where you know, the high technologies are developed. And unless you gain control over these uh, higher technologies, we are always going to be lower down in the international division of labor and become basically supplier of uh, raw materials. Eh? Now, from, uh, seen from that perspective, what has happened in Brazil in the last uh, 30 years is a total disaster because uh, the economy basically went backward. Yeah? Mm -hmm. In that now that you are, in proportional terms, even more dependent on primary commodities than, say, 25 years ago. Yeah? Absolutely. So I think uh, that this is a uh, serious uh, problem, and yeah, I really wish uh, that something is done uh, before the regression becomes irreversible, which uh, that might soon become. Unfortunately, you have uh, exactly the wrong government that uh, pushing things in the uh, opposite direction. Because that, uh, once you lose too much of your manufacturing base, then it kind of disintegrates. Eh? I mean, that's what happened in the United Kingdom, you know, that this country once uh, used to produce 60% you know, uh, of, uh, no, sorry, that about 50% of total world trade in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, it's that uh, uh, insignificant. I mean, in per capita terms, it's only about the 23rd biggest manufacturing country in the world. You know, the, the, it's the manufacturing bases that are disappearing. I mean, the Brazil you know, the, might soon reach that stage. I mean, and <laughs> despite not having even reached that peak as uh, Britain did uh, before. And yeah, I mean, unlike uh, many other developing countries, uh, the Brazil has uh, the kind of uh, capability to reverse this uh, through accelerated uh, innovation and, you know, uh, productivity growth. You know, I mean, in some developing countries, they just don't have the ability to generate uh, their own technologies. Yeah? Mm. Brazil has that. So, I mean, it's uh, still, I mean, there's still some hope, but, you know, if uh, this uh, liberal policy is uh, pursued for another five, ten years, I mean, uh, even that will disappear. Yeah? And then how are you going to rebuild the economy? I mean, uh, you cannot you know, maintain high standard of living in a continental sized country based on soybean and beef, you know, and then, you know, iron oil and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even oil. That's right, oil. Yeah, yeah. now, no, the, 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 
how can most uh, actual uh, discussion about the possibility of selling the Brazilian airplane uh, yeah. manufacturer in Braia to Boeing, yeah. uh, which was uh, an activity that started initially uh, as a state-owned uh, company. It was privati privatized later on, unfortunately. But it, it is still Brazil and it has been progressing. Uh, but now it's... No, no, this is a very dangerous uh, proposition because, uh, you know, if you are talking about, I don't know, I mean, merger of Boeing and Airbus, yeah? mm -hmm. the two are similar size. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So even so if uh, that, yeah, that's right. Even if uh, one of them take over the other, yeah. probably, I mean, the, a lot of things will be done in the country that was taken over. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But in the case of Brazil, I mean, the, what I mean, the Boeing's in terms of production, something like. 40 times bigger than Embraer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So for Boeing, I mean, Embraer will be a tiny branch. Sure. I mean, they, yeah, will keep it open for a while, but then, you know, 10 years later, there might be a CEO saying, well, I mean, this is uh, the insignificant yeah. and we are going to close it down. Yeah? And, and then you will Seattle. have, exactly, you will have uh, lost uh, all the capabilities that was so kind of uh, carefully and painfully built up mm -hmm. over this uh, 40, 50 year period. Yeah, yeah right. But uh, which role do you think that the present hegemony of uh, financial capital uh, applies in, in, uh, or contributes to this to those difficulties that we are facing? No, this is uh, crucial. Sector? This is crucial because, you know, a lot of what the corporations do these days is basically to please this uh, short-term oriented finance capital. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because these are people who, yeah, I mean, uh, don't really have any commitment to any particular company or particular industry or particular country. You know, for them, you know, investing in Embraer is the uh, same as, I don't know, I mean, uh, buying government bond or mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, Burkina Faso, uh, mm. or you know, the investing in some you know, dubious uh, the, the, the derivative product uh, in the United States. You know, so for them, I mean, the most important thing is that the, the highest return in the shortest uh, time span uh, uh, possible. So a lot of uh, the things that these uh, the large corporations do, especially in the U.S. and the U.K., of course, in countries like Japan and Germany their influence is much lower because uh, there are mm. all this uh, the ownership structure and worker representation and so on that make uh, this uh, short-term oriented policies uh, difficult to implement. But in countries like the US and uh, Britain, I mean, this is uh, what basically companies are totally focused on. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 in this uh, scheme, uh, if you are a company in a developing country or even a government of a developing country, you are really totally at the mercy of uh, these people insofar as you have an open capital market, which Brazil does. You know? mm -hmm. China doesn't. You know? mm -hmm. uh, India uh, is more open than China, but still has a lot of restrictions. Uh -huh. But Brazil is uh, totally open. So the, yeah. what happens in the Brazil is basically determined in the world street uh, eventually. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. No, that's true, and uh, the main struggle of uh, Brazilian business or industrialists today is uh, how can we join any global production chain, assembling yeah. maybe simple things here, and the profit obviously being invested in the, the financial markets. That's right. And that's what is... Well, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, why do Brazilian capitalists have such low ambition? Yeah, it's impressive. <laughs> I mean, the, the, take the case of South Korea. I mean, of course, I'm not saying that our capitalists are some kind of angels, but, you know, companies like Samsung, LG, these uh, leading electronics uh, mm -hmm. producers, yeah? Mm -hmm. They started out by assembling the cheapest electronics product mm -hmm. in the 1960s for American and Japanese companies. Yeah? Yeah. So cheap transistor radios, you know, basic mm -hmm. uh, black and white TV. 
but uh, these guys wanted to be to move on. yeah in the major league uh, the, so to speak so they kept investing kept improving productivity kept training workers you know kept uh, investing in r d now they are you know in the big league yeah? mm -hmm. but why are brazilian capitalists so unambitious yeah? that's a good question one of your colleagues from uh, the University of Campinas used uh -huh. to say that uh, Brazilian capitalist doesn't exist, exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Probably that's the right diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. Finally, uh, do you think there is any perspective, at least in medium uh, term, of uh, more regulation and control of uh, capital flow, uh, of financial flows? Oh, I mean, a lot of people agree that that's necessary, but the financial, financial sector has become so large and so powerful, they're just uh, pouring money yeah, mm -hmm. into lobbying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, even financial regulators, you know, the, they, you know, when they are implementing regulation, they are basically implementing regulation that will affect their future employers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they'll think twice, yeah, because, yeah. That, uh, yeah, today maybe you are in the financial regulatory authority, tomorrow you'll be working in the financial sector, yeah? You don't want to uh, create reputation that this guy is, yeah, uh, nasty, this guy is uh, anti-finance, yeah? <laughs> so, I mean, these people have enormous influence, but, you know, in the end, I mean, uh, this is uh, exactly why we need uh, democracy, yeah? mm -hmm. Because only when the, the majority of citizens are one, is to be controlled, politicians will do it. Even then, the financial sector will you know, the, try to make you sure that the, the, uh, there's as the, the little regulation as possible. But I mean, unless the, the citizens uh, the speak up, you know, unless uh, they demand it, this is not going to happen. You know? Because there's no way that the, the financial sector will do it voluntarily, there's no way that uh, the government officials will do it uh, without uh, political pressure. Mm -hmm. Only the democratic pressures that, uh, that can do this. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for you. Uh, your participation and for your terrific uh, opinions. It will be certainly very uh, helpful for our debates and particularly uh, this year when we are going through uh, electoral process mm -hmm. and hopefully we can <laughs> adapt in 2019 some of your opinions, <laughs> so, uh, some yeah. of your ideas. Thank you very and much. We hope to have you back here again. Thank you. So thank you very much. <laughs> Bom, essa, essa foi então a entrevista com o professor Ha Jun Chang da Universidade de Economia de Cambridge e, como vocês puderam ver, uma série de ideias que vêm ao encontro do que muitos de nós pensamos também sobre o que deveria ser o desenvolvimento brasileiro. Obrigado.